I'm Nick Braithwaite from the Open University and I'd like to talk about what we've been doing recently on remote experiments. This was before Covid, long time before Covid. We've had to do it because of our distance learning model. To cut to the end, in case you drift off, we're going to get this again. We've got to the end. This is where I'm going to try and go. I'm going to try and explain why we've got to design these experiments from new and not retrofit them. We have to make them easy to reach, and so we use a browser interface. They've got to be useful, so they've got to be embedded in the curriculum because the curriculum needs them. They've got to be used, and the only way to get them used is to give marks, so put them into assessment. And they've got to be reliable, because if they're in assessment, they really do have to be available. They must work, or they must fail well and convincingly. Let's go back and do a little bit of history. Um, practical inquiries at a distance. This has been the challenge for the Open University. We started with a few models. One of them was home experiment kits. There's a picture here which shows um, a home experiment kit being explored by a couple of people here. Uh, looks like there's a physics kit in the background and a chemistry kit in the foreground just being unpacked and played with at the kitchen sink. It's okay, I and mean, we've had to reinvent this recently during COVID for our engineering students. We sent them some home kits out. There's a challenge in making sure that people unpack the kits. So again, put them in assessment, that's a good idea. That they use them at the right time and in the right kind of way. And that any bits that we didn't supply, such as, I don't know, maybe the electricity or the lighting, something that we have less control of, that that, that is somehow constrained sufficiently well to be able to do the experiments. Inevitably, it ends up a little bit more like a recipe, following a recipe, than really doing an experiment. We played, played with TV broadcasts, with videos. Uh, they began as TV broadcasts in the middle of the night. Here's a picture of my colleague Russell Stannard, a former winner of the Bragg Medal and Prize from the IOP. Uh, and he was doing some experiments there. I'm not quite sure which experiment he's doing. I think he's about to drop something and watch it bounce. Then we've also done residential laboratory classes where we've done experiments in a borrowed lab location. We've gone to other people's campuses in the summertime when they were quiet. Couldn't do that during COVID. And in some areas we stopped doing that some time ago because the, the costs are quite high for the benefits. And there are other ways. Here's one of the other ways that we looked at. This is an interactive screen experiment. So we're now doing experiments in software. But it is real data. This was about 2006, this one. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the plan view. Over here, the plan view of an experiment. This is a 35 millimeter slide, which actually contains a diffraction grating seen in section here in the side elevation. And you get, according to which angle you're looking at, you get one or more of these colours. I just overlaid those to indicate a spectrum. But you get a particular line at a particular angle. And so this reference head here can be moved by these arrows. And as it moves around, the image that is actually projected on here is the one that corresponds to what was seen when perfectly aligned at that angle. Neat. Uh, you could just send people the slide. That's what we did do and have them do the experiment for themselves. But for some people who couldn't quite set that up, this was an alternative. And then we've been exploring for a number of years remote experiments. So these are real experiments. They're actually done. You connect people to, for example, a telescope, telescopes up a mountain in Tenerife, or a radio telescope on the Milton Keynes campus, or streaming data of this BOD, is biological, biochemical oxygen demand. And on the, the right hand side is a piece of experimental x-ray apparatus. There's an x-ray tube just lighting up here. This whole thing is about 40-50 uh, centimetres across. Give you an idea of the scale of that. But we weren't, and when we did that in 2000, uh, well, we started doing it I suppose in 2012 uh, into the curriculum, but we'd been, colleagues had been researching this back in 2002. That's some time ago now. And what they were trying to do was to take one of our practical laboratory experiments, the sort of thing that we did in one of those residential schools, and put some things around it, some motors around it, and some cameras on it, 
so that you could essentially do the experiment without being there, without putting your hands on it. Interesting results that they found. They found, yes, you can do it. But in 2002, there were challenges. Challenges to do with making sure that you could get the students to have the right software on a computer of the right specification. Challenges about things like screen resolution you could put in small thumbnails here of the video of a, of a vernier scale and, and try to read it and then the, the wide angle lab shot underneath that's the vernier scale there and here's the wide angle lab shot underneath here's a view down the telescope trying to do the sorts of things that you do if you were in the lab but possibly some more rethinking was necessary not the only people at it between 2006 and 2019 MIT had an iLabs project but it was noted in 2019, if you go to their website now, you'll say it's come to a close. And there's a historical record. They had a number of instruments that were put online. And you can see here there's uh, an oscilloscope, and this is probably some kind of sweep generator, and some electronic circuit here. And, and these things were available and could be used from a distance by connecting to benchtop apparatus, essentially. And then the engineers have been doing this certainly since 2016, really quite active with, with the two communities here, the Global Online Laboratory Consortium and the International Association of Online Engineering. They combine and have a conference, annual conference on remote experiments. And then our playing around began possibly back in 2006, 2013, certainly. We were doing a little bit more seriously. 2015 it got even more serious with some more investment and still going strong in 2020 and 2021 when things like pandemics come and we sat back and, and we were happy to go on delivering our laboratory work this way claiming as it says at the bottom that it's virtually better than the real thing pandemic proof in essence we have an internet of laboratory things where those things are big kit the telescopes in Tenerife, the radio telescope in Milton Keynes, a couple of scanning electron microscopes. Um, we'll get, go have a look at a scanning electron microscope right now. Let's do that. Let's come out of there and go to... Here is a scanning electron microscope. It's running live now. Just check the levels on it. There's a specimen here. Let's have a look at the specimen uh, on the table. These stub holders here, these are holes where you put stubs and they're a couple of centimetres apart. That gives you an idea of the scale of the samples that we got inside. And this particular sample, this particular sample, uh, which I've just moved where we're looking, uh, is a piece of silica and it has a large crack in it, but I've, I've lost the crack, would you believe it? Let's, let's be a little bit patient. Um, I want to go to that point there. This really shows it working, doesn't it? Because I'm just exploring this in real time now. There's some of that crack section. That's round about where I had it so before. And we could now zoom in and look at this debris. Here, for example, a piece of cracked off material. Let's zoom in a little bit more. That's now a hundred micrometers that scale bar down there, so we're getting now below the limits of how you get in your optical instruments. Focus just needs adjusting a little bit now, maybe. I mean, I'll tell you what I do, I'm going to put a secondary electron detector on instead of a bank scatter detector, and when that image changes in just a moment, now, now we're seeing a little bit more of the, the morphology of the surface. Yeah. But now the morphology of the surface, a little bit of tweak on the focus. And this is now going into demonstration mode, but I could set you a challenge here or something to do within this if I were teaching with it. I'll just show my focus up a little bit there. And I'll just zoom out again. That, that's a live instrument. That's working right now. And I'm talking to you, and it's, I don't know, 150,000 pounds, uh, that, that equipment. And we can let our students lose it. And we give them bookings, and they book a set session. They can also book through to other instrumentation. Here is a piece of apparatus, this is bench top apparatus from our engineering laboratory. I'm going to switch this on. It's a disc, it's about the size of a CD. 
Uh, and I'll just make sure we get lab sound coming through here. I'm going to switch this on. And hear that then. And switch it off. Change its speed. So that, that's happening now. Right now, as I'm recording this talk, that is actually happening in Milton Keynes. I'm not in Milton Keynes, but that is. And look how it's spinning. I hear it spinning a little bit like that. And I'll turn the volume down a bit. And we can get some data from that. It's actually a light chopper. That's what those slots in there are doing. Stop it a minute and you can see that there are slots in here, different things. Slots chop the light in different ways. And, and I'll put it up again. I can get some data from here. And when you do this, we're now cycling the square wave. And it's not uh, not too many data points. I can do with more data points. So I'll increase the sampling rate. The sound's automatically turned down to stop it being too annoying at the moment. And there's more samples. Mm, we've got more samples, but I need many more samples, so let's get a thousand samples and then we can get some, some data now where we've got many more points. I can zoom in on the trace here and you can see my data points, many, many more data points now and that allows me in the spectral analysis here to be able to see that I've got the odd harmonics that you'd expect from the square wave. Uh, right, let's turn that off and get the noise down. And uh, we should probably go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, I could go on playing with that for some time. Um, we have wind tunnels, we have uh, high performance liquid chromatography, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, optical microscopes, that's the big kit still. And then what you're seeing there, the, that light chopping circuit, that is one of these. Uh, this is our benchtop apparatus set out. Is it? scale length here I put on about 40 centimeters but this is now done in three dimensions we don't need to do it in two dimensions which is what a conventional lab does so this is one of the advantages of remote experiments your lab footprint goes down because the student is here this webcam here looking at the apparatus or this webcam looking at the apparatus this is a pendulum experiment so we'll be swinging it there um, we don't need to leave room for the student because the student is connected from a distance so this is now our internet of the variety of things with a big capacity. We can have very large labs of people working simultaneously, but we don't have to be open in lab hours. We can have these open almost 24 seven. So what we found, what is the impact of, of these remote experiments? Uh, well, our core practical component of STEM qualifications in physics, astronomy, chemistry, life sciences, environment engineering, computing, uses it a lot. We last year provided around 30,000 student hours of remote connection to laboratories. That, that's not one student for 30,000 hours and it's not 30,000 students for one hour, but it's a few hours for a very large number of students. And about 50 of the 150 activities that we have use remote experiments. They're not all remote experiments. Some of them are like those interactive screen experiments, but we've got about a third of them really do connect our students to real apparatus. And in those cases, we've seen that the, the retention of students in our programs, the progression of them through the programs, is something like a 5% increase in engagement. It's not easy to tie ex that figure exactly to having remote experiments. There's a, quite a lot of factors that affect whether or not students are retained within a program. But it's certainly there is a correlation that, that indicates that having them certainly not losing a student and it looks as if it's helping to maintain engagement. In fact, we've also got quite a lot of evidence now from the inst professional institutions the, in physics, biosciences, engineering, the accreditors commending the approach that we've got. They are some of the hardest people to persuade that what you're doing is worthwhile. And we have some independent um, assessments from the QAA and uh, even from the United States. Um, an accreditation body here within the United States um, looked at what we're doing and thought it was going good. What do the students think? Lots of comments. I'm only going to give you one here, but this is a student who was doing one of our space science modules and um, found it uh, intellectually demanding, good exercises with our robotic telescope and with the robotic microscopes using that SEM that I was showing you just there. And then a Mars rover activity, which is again a remote experiment. Now, of course, some of the best remote experiments done on the planet right now 
are being done on Mars. They're, they're so remote. And so we have got a Mars facility. It's not actually on Mars. It's in a shed in Milton King, but it allows people to control a rover in much the same way as you would do a real rover on Mars. And that's not controlling it in real time because it's so far away that you have to do it in delayed time. So you have to have an autonomous vehicle and preload it with instructions and so on. But that's good remote experimentation. So we claim that what we're doing is we're giving people the skills to do the kind of experimental work that is required in real life. Let's have a look at one or two headline challenges and, and what are, how we responded to those challenges. I've listed them here on the left hand side. It costs money to acquire the kit. It costs money to develop the kit. It costs money to keep the kit going. And it has to function simply. We don't have a control over the computer that the students have got. But what we do know is that they need a certain bandwidth. Uh, and they, they need a minimum standard of operating system. We hope they've got that. But to make sure that it's usable, we need to make sure that it's, it's as accessible as we can be, as their, as their laptop is for anything else, or their, their desktop is for anything else. So nothing special about doing the experiments other than being able to connect to those experiments. Therefore, use a browser, and wherever possible, use a browser interface. Uh, we've got to make sure that there is engagement, and to do that, well, let's see. I think we're going to put some assessment in there. Let's answer some of those. We'll, we'll go down. Let's have a look. How are you going to do with that acquisition? Capital investment. You can't do this on the cheap. Development. You need technical developers. An enthusiast can do one of these, but when you've got 50 of them, you're going to need some, some technical expertise, some professional support to get this right and, and to make sure that the thing is not dependent on one person who developed it. There's a team behind this. That's quite a good lesson, actually. If you make it dependent on one person and that person gets ill, for whatever reason, or, or gets poached by another institution, then you can be in trouble. And to operationalise it, you need to embed it in the curriculum. Then you've got income. Because if it's in the curriculum, you've got income. And the income will maintain it, it but it won't buy it in the first instance. For that, you need a capital investment. That's what we found. Uh, and uh, for that functionality, the browser interface, for the usability, experts and accessibility need to be engaged. To get that engagement, put it in the assessment. If you put it in the assessment, it must work. Student satisfaction, it's got to be reliable and it must work or it must fail really nicely. Fail well, I call this. And then students will be satisfied. It's like being in a real lab. In a real lab, things fail. That's okay as long as they can be repaired quickly and brought back on stream, or you learn from the failure. And so you need to build that in. And in order to work and fail well, you need to build these from the beginning. Retrofitting an existing benchtop experiment is probably not the right thing to do. We've tried it. It's probably not the right thing to do. Much better to conceive the experiment from the outset. A bit like trying to take your lectures online. Probably better to reconceive the whole thing this is an online experience rather than just trying to make a video of a lecture. Uh, and for credibility and acceptance, you need to be able to showcase these things. And that's something we definitely learned and benefited from in the end. So I'll draw to a close there. What I would like to claim is what we found is that we can be virtually better than the real thing. We can use remote experiments to take people to laboratories well, no, to take laboratories to people over the internet, but to put them out, out in position where they can control the data. They can obtain their own primary data. They can own it. And they can engage with apparatus, which is extremely expensive. There are telescopes, a quarter of a million pounds or so. And we have to design it so that it's foolproof, so they're not going to be able to, to break it, but they're going to have that feeling that they are dealing with really important, high-end equipment capable of getting very interesting data. And in the case of some of our astronomy, it has even made it into the research literature. And the key message is there about designing, it's got to be new build, not retrofit, reachable through browser interfaces, embedded in the curriculum, embedded in assessment, and able to work and fail well. Thank you.